so good morning it is a proud moment for all of us to conduct an international webinar on trajectory of covid-19 pandemic awareness treatment and genomic insight for future development it is our extreme privilege and honor to have distinguished faculties eminent academicians in the form of our honorable speakers we have dr pradeep kumar dasmapatra associate professor and head department of microbiology of raiganj university he will deliver his lecture on significance of microbiological knowledge and awareness in 21st century with special reference to covid-19 we have another distinguished faculty with us dr keshav chandra mondol the professor and head department of microbiology vidyasagar university vindapur west bengal he will deliver his speech on post corona interaction the another presentation will be delivered by dr vasudeep pandit associate professor national institute of biomedical genomics kollani her topic of discussion will be covid 19 genomic perspective of pathogen and host on day 2 we will have the lecture from dr atin mondol the eminent scientist and associate professor from division of molecular medicine bos institute calcutta the final presentation will be given by dr deepak bhargav professor and head department of microbiology as well as acting vice principal of national medical college nepal he will deliver his lecture on pharmacological approaches to combat sars cov2 infection so we will all be enlightened by their work their thoughts and their ideas i convey my most sincere regards to the all respected speakers to find some time for us the department of microbiology has started its journey since 2002 it has the legacy of arranging many academic and social awareness program however it is the first time that we are organizing an international webinar i feel glad to announce that we have received more than 1200 registration from various parts of the country and abroad i am thankful to the all respected faculty members from colleges and universities from iits distinguished scientists from premier organizations like isro and drdo doctors and medical personnel research scholars students of ug and pg level students of various schools non teaching staffs and to all who has shown interest to participate in this program for the betterment of the society we never got deviated from the blessings of our honorable principal sir dr sumil kumar mukherjee i am grateful to him and to the all respected faculty members of our college for their continuous encouragement and support now may i request our honorable principal sir to deliver the welcome address sir amrar principal sir please increase your volume namaskar good morning everybody my regards to honorable dignitaries my love and best wishes to my colleagues my friends my juniors and my beloved students who are attending this webinar i welcome all of you on on behalf of bakura shumilini college to two day international webinar as organized by the department of microbiology on the topic trajectory of covid 19 pandemic awareness treatment and future geno genomic insight for future development i must be thankful to dr orindam ganguli and his team professor saurabh singh and all the departmental students to render their persistent efforts in organizing this webinar on such a relevant and burning topic of the day i also we are also grateful to honorable vice chancellor bakura university 
for conveying his best wishes message to us on this very occasion. We have already got introduction of our honorable speakers of these two days, 14th and 15th June 2020. So I am not going to introduce further. Dr. Orindam Ganguly has completed that part. Now, before entering into the actual topic of discussion, I want to add a few words about our college. Ours is a NAC accredited second cycle, B plus graded college, established on 1st September 1948, being situated at the heart of the Makuda district town with two nearby colleges, Makuda Christian College and Makuda Jela Sharadamuni Mohila Mahavidyapitch. We were initially under Makuda Shammelani Trust Body, hence the name Makuda Shammelani and affiliated to Calcutta University. In the year 1962, our affiliation was shifted to Badawan University. And at present, we are under newly formed Makuda University on and from 1st January 2017. A total of 3,000 students have been getting the scope of pursuing their higher studies in both undergraduate and postgraduate courses. In undergraduate subjects, 18 subjects are there in arts, science, and commerce. Whereas in postgraduate courses, there are two subjects, English and chemistry. Now let us come to the point of COVID-19. We are very much familiar with this term during the last few months, and also our minds become full of panic when we, when we heard hear this COVID-19. Because every day we are getting the reports of deaths, thousands of report, people are dying every day from all over the world. At present, more near about 80 lakh people have been affected. And more than 4 lakh people have already died. The countries like the USA, the Brazil, Russia, Germany, Italy, Spain, France are highly victimized. And recently India has also joined the rally. In the question of number of attacks of this COVID-19, India has now secured the fourth position after the USA, Brazil, Russia, and then India. A total of more than 3 lakh people have been affected at present, and near about 9,000 people have died. And good news is that the recovery rate is also high, 50% about total infected people, then we 1 lakh 36,000 so far report received from the health ministry, government of India. Now, what, let us know what is COVID-19 and what is coronavirus. In December 2019, a disease outbreak was reported from Wuhan, China. On 31st December 2019, it was traced to a novel strain of coronavirus. And it was initially named as 2019 NCOV, but later on it was renamed by the International Committee Taxonomy of Viruses as SARS-CoV-2. SARS means Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. And this new strain is a group of beta coronavirus of group 2B. It has 70% similarity with SARS-CoV and 96% similarity with the beta bad coronavirus. Hence, it is also suspected that this virus is originated from bat. And the disease in human, which is caused by this virus, is known as 
COVID-19. And World Health Organization has considered his public health emergency of international concern on 30th January 2020 and on 11th March 2020 it was declared pandemic on account of its global outbreak and since then nationwide lockdowns and travel restrictions have been imposed in different countries and there were personal level precautionary measures are also being taken. Now, let us come to the point of symptoms. What are the symptoms of COVID-19? Fever, fatigue, sore throat, respiratory trouble, respiratory tract infection. And the virus is highly transmissible. It transmits from one host to another through close contact, through respiratory droplets, either by sneezing or cough, and excel also. And this virus survive for several hours on table, chairs, on door handles, when it, they are com these are contaminated by infected persons. The incubation period of this virus is 14 days. Incubation, that means the entry of the pathogen within the host and expression, final expression of these symptoms is 14 days. It is not always that all, everybody who, every person who gets attacked by this virus will show the symptom. Some so mild, get mild symptoms and they recover also. While others who have got less immunity power, particularly aged people, they will be more victim of this COVID-19. Now, question, question of treatment. Regarding treatment, actually there is no approved treatment, treatment or vaccine till date. So what is to be done? We have to follow the personal level precautionary measures and also government guidelines. That means the Maintaining social distancing, which is government is repeatedly instructing the public to follow the social distancing so that virus cannot come in close, uh, cannot transmit through close contact. Through by washing our hands at regular intervals with hand sanitizers or soaps, using face mask. So that the while we sneeze or when we cough, the respiratory droplets do not, do not come out. Avoid touching our hands, uh, touching our nose, eyes, or mouth with our hands. And practicing respiratory hygiene. That means while sneezing or coughing we should cover our mouth or nose by bent elbow, which is also instructed by the government also. So these are the precautionary measures we can take. Now, question of treatment, as there is no, I've already told that the no confirmed or approved case uh, treatment. Although some medicines like hydroxychloroquine, the quinine compound, or remdesivir, the broad spectrum antiviral drug, are being produced by biopharmaceutical companies. They are doing well. And they are used also in many countries like USA, Britain, in India also. And the homeopathy also, it is, it is claimed that some medicines like Arsenic alba, Bryonia alba, Gelsimium, they are also doing well in bringing the immunity power of the public. Now, regarding the genomic constitution, genomic insight of this virus, this virus is single stranded positive sense RNA virus. It is the largest among the RNA viruses with 26 to 32 kilobases. 
This virus and the nucleocapsid with helical symmetry is enclosed within a cover sheath that is made up of lipid bilayer in which the spikes, club shaped spikes, are anchored. These club shaped spikes, about 74 in number, average. They are arranged in such a way that they form an image reminiscent of solar corona, hence why, hence the name coronavirus. Now this virus, this RNA genome has the five methylated cap at the five days end and polyadenylated tail at the three days end. So during the replication of this virus, when it attaches the host complementary shell, the spikes which helps for attachment, the RNA genome gets entered into the host cell. After entering the into the host cell, the virus gets uncoated first. Then this RNA is released in the cytoplasm and attaches itself with the host ribosome for future translation. The RNA recombination is the guiding force for determination of genetic variability, for capability of the pathogen to jump from one host to another, and also determining the release of the new coronavirus. So, I think most researches are already being pursued in different corners of the world. And till date, 150 projects have been undertaken to grow vaccines, to develop vaccines against this COVID-19. And I think in near future, we'll get better results, better report also. And we'll get more information about the topic from our honorable speakers in these two days and get ourselves enriched with their knowledge. And I wish this seminar a grand success. And at the same time, I wish the invention of vaccine in near future for the welfare of mankind. Thank you. Thank you all the best. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your vivid presentation on COVID-19. And thank you for your warm welcome address. Now we are able to start our lecture session, but we are able to start our uh, next lecture from Dr. Vaswati Pandit. OK. I am welcoming Dr. Vaswati Pandit. Uh, Dr. Ganguly, please introduce her. Dr. Vasudhi Pandit is an associate professor at the National Institute of Biomedical Genomics, Kollani. She works in the area of genomics of infectious diseases. Her research focus is host genomics of tuberculosis infection, identifying genomic correlates and readout of host that makes the individual susceptible to the disease. She is trained in chemistry and biochemistry from University of Calcutta and subsequently obtained her PhD from Saha Institute of Nuclear Physics. She did her postdoctoral research at Medical University of South Carolina and Mount Sinai School of Medicine, New York, USA, working on identification of genes, causal mutation, and mechanisms for genetic diseases. On return, she joined National Institute of Biomedical Genomics, Kollani, where the research focus of the institute is to understand human health and disease using genomic knowledge leading to advancement of genetics based healthcare. Her publication includes infection, genetics evolution, tuberculosis, journal of proteome and others. She serves with the editorial board of journal of genetics. Now may I request Dr. Vasuthi Pandit to please deliver her valuable speech.
okay so uh, is it can you can you see the slides i think no no ma'am uh, ma'am no? go to okay. the top bar and go to the slide yeah yeah ha uh, ha huh. yeah now now it's okay right yes yeah. okay uh, good afternoon everybody and at the beginning i would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present some aspects the genomic aspects of this recent disease the pandemic outbreak and uh, even though i do not see uh, principal professor mukherjee but i would like to also thank him at the beginning because he had given a good introduction to the disease now um, my earlier speakers already have spoken a lot about the disease as well as the pathogen so i will quickly glance through the introduction all of you know that this is caused by the infection the viral infection sars cov 2 or novel cov 2 it's not that it, the coronavirus pandemic is first time happening to the mankind we had earlier episodes and five or six episodes of coronavirus but the severity or the spread was much less that's why we are not that much aware and also the present generation have not seen that other than sars this uh, sars cov started in 2019 end of 2019 and probably from the seafood market where the source could be the different animals now the sars virus and the mars causing virus they are the siblings of this sars cov 2 bat is a natural reservoir for many viruses and it also harbors the sars cov as well from bat possibly it went to pangolin as well uh, i'll come to little uh, details or the evidence for such uh, comment but this sars cov 2 virus has low mutation rate but the fearing factor is that it has high human to human transmissibility that means it can easily transmit from one person to another and the other uh, concerning thing is that we have been never exposed to this sars cov 2 therefore this is like we are having a new enemy so with uh, against which our immunity has never seen that or has never fought back for that so that is the only concern that we have this is also mentioned my by my previous uh, speakers that it's a positive strain rna virus with the genome being 29 to 30 kb so it has rna as its genome and it codes many proteins many of which are polypept uh, coded as a single from the single polypeptides or single uh, uh, kind cystronic kind of thing that's why you might see that there is variation in the number but anyway now uh, one concept i would like to give to all of you is that we know that for a infectious disease pathogen is necessary without pathogen we cannot have an infectious disease we do not call it an infectious disease but is the pathogen sufficient it's necessary but it's not the sufficient thing so the other factors that come into play is the host and the environment so even if you are exposed with the pathogen you may not have the disease so what controls here it it is known now that with lot of studies and unequivocally proved that the host factors the host genomics and the genomics which control these factors and controls the regulate and regulates these factors are one of the important aspects for a uh, infectious disease to <clears throat> uh to establish or the pathogen to establish it inside the host besides that there are environmental factors too now what are these environmental factors it's very complicated to decide upon the effect of these factors but factors like say nutrition good health condition good environment these also have role in protection of the disease from uh, or protection of an individual from the pathogen now not only the single pathogen but sometimes along with the real pathogen there exist other microbes like say for tuberculosis hiv is another factor that adds on or that uh, or that uh, makes a person more vulnerable to the disease 
similarly in case of covid also we see that people are interested to look into other lung infection like say tv infection etc and how both the pathogens where which both residing in the lungs and how do they communicate among themselves as well as the host so this brings all the complications to the situation and it's really a complex situation to understand the pathogenesis of an infectious disease because it's a combination of not only the one genome not the host but it's a com complement interaction between the host and the pathogen as well where the environmental factors are aiding or is in against the pathogenesis now coming uh, to covid 19 you know that it's mostly spreading to, through the droplets uh, through breath coming out of an infected person but it can also it's highly contagious therefore if the pathogen is on your hand on door handle etc other places also and if you touch those places and then your nose or your mouth that can go through so not only the infected person but the surrounding can also to some extent um, has role in spreading therefore we have to remain very cautious but when somebody is exposed to this pathogen it is not that everybody has the disease in other infectious disease it has been seen that some percentage of people are able to clear the infection for covid 19 right now we do not know what percentage of people can clear the infection without showing any symptoms but we know that whoever is exposed can lead to two fates one is the asymptomatic condition where the person doesn't show any infection uh, or signs of infection or disease but the other person who develops active disease after the latency period say 4 to 14 days whatever depending on the health situation of the person so the concern is the asymptomatic person because you do not know whether they harbor the pathogen or not whereas the active person we know that he has the disease we can remain uh, cautious that we should not come in direct contact with the person or come in contact with the person with proper precautions now among the active patients also there is different grade of severity some have mild symptoms some do well but at the uh, suddenly at certain condition their health condition deteriorates and there are some other uh, factors as well different persons or different phenotype some show lower um lymphocytes or lymphocytopenia some show other features other complications like clotting of blood etc so we see that in this disease there is a high range high spectrum of uh, a high spectrum of the phenotypes or the severity now what actually determines this let us see how it is balanced so the pathogen several factors from the pathogen side contribute like the strain variation so this i am talking in general about any infectious disease so the strain if it is more virulent that causes more severity the pathogen load is of course another factor more load we expect that it will cause more havoc in the host and also the gene expression of the pathogen that means in that hostile host inside that hostile host the the host is actually not in very much favor of the pathogen the pathogen has to fight a lot to establish itself inside the host so the host gene expression other either in its latent condition where it is hiding and trying to take over the host or if it is in active disease where the pathogen is already in a winning situation so the set of gene expression might be different and that's the strategy of the pathogen to establish itself whereas in the host side we can see that there are several factors the cellular responses the cellular cytokine releases are major factors that control the initial innate immunity uh, that controls the pathogen and all these responses all uh, either the cellular response the cytokine response or other uh, cellular functions these are controlled by the genetic variation of the host so that we know that we all do not respond to a infectious disease equally so what why that is if there are 10 persons exposed to cold infection one might develop severe severe cold in the next day 
whereas the nine other person might develop the severity in next five days and maybe another two, three or four person never develop it. So why does it happen? So this is one of the factors, the inter interlying uh, genetic variation of the host that determines how strong is the immunity of a person and how can it combat the infection. So the balance between these factors coming out of the pathogen as well as the host determines who will win, the pathogen or the host. So now coming to how genomics will help us to understand the disease. So genomics can help us to understand the transmission, the origin of the disease. Like in this case, COVID, we know that it originated from Wuhan and the first person or first few persons have been taken from those patients and the genomic analysis has been done. Their RNA, the genome has been sequenced. So we know that that has originated from there. And then we, as it progressed or spread throughout the world, we are tracking the scientific communities, tracking the changes and how it is transmitted or how it is attaining the virulence. So the mutation comes there. So the virus has changed its uh, genome in multiple places. And when a pathogen jumps from one species to another, the cross species evolution, like it has happened here also that from bat, maybe through pangolin or directly to human being, it has come. So might be that the pathogen has evolved in such of uh, some of its uh, nucleotides in the genome to best uh, ma make it home, the environment inside the host, best for it, okay? Also, that leads to adaptation because the pathogen has to adapt in the new environment. So certain changes in the nucleotides may help it, or in some cases it has been seen that that does not help it. So the pathogen in the new hostile environment cannot survive. And also with this large genomic information, the RNA genome of the virus has helped to construct the phylogeny and how from one place to another while the virus is transmitting, how they are changing. This uh, scale or the phylogeny tree has helped us to understand that after a while, whether the virus still existing or infecting in the United States is same or different from the one that had originated in China. So the first whole genome sequence was for this SARS-CoV-2 was done uh, from Yuhan, the, taken from the patients, and it was published in January 5th, 2020. All these genome informations, there's a common platform where one can deposit and it is shared by the whole scientific community. That's called the Global Initiative on Sharing All Influenza Data, or GSET. Till now, till today, more than 46,000 viral genome across the globe has been deposited there and country wise, the phenotype wise and different parameters are there with which you can identify or go into that site and uh, retrieve the sequence that you are interested. Now, how let me uh, particularly for the students, let me tell how this from the DNA sequence or RNA sequence, how this phylogenetic tree are constructed. Just look into the picture say these different colored balls are the different nucleotides. You can see that the blue is pretty common. It's present across multiple, uh, multiple clinical isolates of the virus. So we conclude that this is something original, which was present earlier and it is still carried by the virus. So on the right hand side, you see that the blue is at the origin of this phylogenetic tree. Now we see that some other, other color codes have come into play, the yellow ones and the red ones. So the yellow are present in some of them, the red are present in some of them, which suggests that from the blue, possibly it has diverged into two groups, the yellow and the red. Now comes the other points, other colors. And as the color comes in multiple colors, we see that they are diverging, they are branching. So this way from the genome sequence of the virus, we can construct their phylogenetic tree. Okay, now, as I uh, said earlier, that I'll come to the point of the pangolin. 
see this paper has uh, constructed the phylogenetic information uh, taking from the SARS-CoV-2 as well as bat and pangolin. So these pangolins were taken from, you can see that GX is one sequence, GD. So GX and GD are the two different places in China, uh, Guangdong and Guangxing or something. So two different provinces. And not that all pangolins harbor the same virus. See that GX virus uh, pangolins are, uh, GX pangolin virus are little distance from the GD1. So when compared and uh, the phylogenetic analysis one was done, the SARS-CoV-2 genome were more close to the bat and next closest was the GD pangolin rather than the GX pangolin. And the bat doesn't harbor only one type of SARS, it can harbor different types which are even distant from the SARS-CoV-2 or the bat mentioned here. So you can see, easily understand that one type of bat harbor this, uh, this virus and this virus is the closest or this virus has evolved to the SARS-CoV-2 which is infecting the humans. Okay, this picture I, am take, I have taken from the GZ database. Uh, it shows the phylogenetic clustering of all the information, sequence information they have have on their sites. And uh, even though 46,000 information is deposit, uh, clinical isolate genome sequence is deposited there, but uh, as of today, 12, no, as of 12 June, they have constructed these haplotypes or the uh, phylogenetics uh, considering 39,000 full genome sequence. These are the different groups, S, L, V, G, H, and there is an other group. This, is, this picture is evolving day by day as they get more and more sequence information. The origin which came from Yuhan had S, L, L, and from there, with time as it progressed, the other uh, clades has appeared. You can also see in this picture that in December there was the gray and very less O. O is the other. Now S and L was here, the two shades of gray, but as time progressed, you see appearance of, dif uh, of the different other clades, the V, G, G, H, G, R, etc. So as time is progressing, the virus is changing its nucleotide, but that doesn't mean that it's a different strain. It is just the same strain with different nucleotides at different position, evolving in different countries. So what was the Indian scenario? The first, <coughs> sorry, the first case was reported in Kerala in January 2020 uh, among students who came back from the China and uh, subsequently their contacts became infected as well as in other states of India, contacts from Europe or other countries as well as China and subsequently their family contacts, friends, etc., spread the disease. Now we did a little bit analysis on the viral genome taking Indian patients or the sequence of the clinical isolates that have been submitted to this GZ. And let me explain uh, so till May 18th, we got 3, 000, uh, 304 genome for analysis and that belonged to possibly 16 states of India. So we clearly see that there are two groups. These circles actually denote, each of these circle denotes a clade and these two are major. The different color defines the different state. And here, this small circle is the original one. You can see if it is, I'm not sure whether it's visible. You can see there are three colors, the white, black, and the uh, pink, which black here, this is the bla uh, black dot. It, refer it refers to the sequence of the Yuhan clinical isolate, the black. Then the white is from the state of Kerala, and the pink is from the state of Telangana. So this was the original sequence that was uh, found in the clinical isolates in the India, either people came back from China, mostly, or other uh, places uh, in abroad. And from there, then when it infected other uh, people in the country, so there are changes. So one, we denoted here LV. If you remember in the previous slide, I showed there is L strain, L clade, sorry, not strain. And we in our analysis with the Indian isolates, 
we de uh, designated this as LV because it had a new change other than whatever is mentioned. Let me go back to the other, uh, the previous, uh, sorry, the previous slide. Actually, here it's very small. You cannot see possibly, but if you go to the GZ database, you can see that the S means what are the changes in the nucleotide or protein it is mentioned here. So apart from these changes in the uh, LV, we found another change A97V which was in the polymerase protein. This sequence, the change has been reported by multiple uh, states when they had sequenced the clinical isolates. So these two major strains were found among the clinical isolates from India, the LV and G. And then from G, there were different other things like GR, GH, etc. was present. Now this G group was mostly predominant in the isolates in Gujarat, whereas the four states, Bengal, Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, and um, Gujarat, where the mortality rate is high, we found that the G clade was more present in these states. Now, uh, this was supported by one evidence from one report from Sheffield, where they also reported that high mortality rate was found in the person who are infected with the G clades. Right now, we are increasing our samples. Now, right now, more than uh, 7,000 Indian isolate sequence is available, and we are trying to see whether this still holds good in the when we replenish this with more number of sequences. So our frequency, when we analyze the genome of these 304 isolates, there were multiple variants which were in very low frequency but high in number. So we neglected the frequency, the variants which were less than 1%. And we find that these are the different type changes that we see. The C to T uh, changes were the most common. And when we looked into the amino acids, the most uh, frequently uh, changed proteins were was the NSP3 and the S protein. Now, coming to the uh, comparison, uh, even though this table is shown in a different orientation, but I would like to focus your attention only to these two tables, which are written in a proper way. It will be easy for you to understand. See that here we have made a comparison with the clinical isolates, the changes what we see compared to the rat and the pangolin. And we see that the gray boxes are the showing the changes that changes have occurred from rat or pangolin to the human, except two, uh, sorry, three shown here in yellow boxes where the change is either in the rat, uh, uh, sorry, the bat or the pangolin. It is not that both the, the changes are present in <clears throat> bat as well, pang, as well as pangolin. Now, people have also looked into intra-host variability. What they have done, they have sequenced the clinical isolate taken from the same patient multiple times. Like here, I mentioned one reference where they have sequence or sample 32 times from eight patient and they see changes when they go later part of the time. So out of 40 such changes, 30 changes were from the single patient and the 10 changes were present at least two patients. And they had sample from the respiratory tract as well as the gastrointestinal tract. And it was found that more di viral diversity was present in the gastrointestinal tract. So we see that even though uh, you are infected with some virus, the virus goes to multiple organ and their adaptability and their change in the genome might be different, which also happens with increase of time. The most uh, discussed protein of the pathogen is the spike protein because that's the anchoring point of the pathogen to the host. And the spike protein has some critical region, which is the RBD which binds to the host receptor. Now, some amino acids are very critical here. So if there is change in these amino acids, like one example is D614G. So the change, of course, from the point of evolution should help sorry, the pathogen to bind more strongly to the host so that it can invade the host. So the mutation in these regions are also critical. Therefore, sequencing from the sequence information, we can 
find out whether which region is hypermutable in the virus taking or making the virus in and taking it to an advantageous position in the host so so far we i was discussing about the pathogen now let us come to the host genomics and the question is why how does it help so it will knowing host genomics will help us to know how the host will respond to infection as i mentioned earlier that there is variability in the response not that all hosts respond to the drug in a similar way you from your daily experience you can find out that some for some people low low dose of drug is effective whereas some people high drug high dose of drug is required so from host we can also discover a biomarker of the host and that can be taken to a point of care test for detection as uh, an example i can mention that the bio, uh, the uh, antibody people are looking for in the plasma so detection of antibody or detection of these kind of molecules in the host can be used for a point of care test and also we can characterize the latent period in the of the pathogen most of uh, pathogens when infect they the host goes through a latency period and also we can understand the evolution history of the pathogen inside the host so so as i mentioned that even though there are different viral loads the patient can be still asymptomatic or mild symptoms and but the person even though it's mild symptomatic or asymptomatic has the potential to transmit so that is dangerous therefore to identify this individuals is extremely necessary and of course i mentioned that there is high inter individual variation in the symptoms as well as severity so coming to back to the same slide again just i want to mention that therefore a uh, uh, genomic study is necessary to identify the factors why these individuals show different symptoms and apart from that also you know that there are some comorbid factors like somebody with lung or uh, heart ailments that leads to that adds on that adds on fuel to the severity of the disease so one read out of covid-19 as well is the cytokines uh, what are cytokines they are small protein or peptides that is secreted out by mostly by immune cells if, with few exceptions and they participate in the immune process so when there is infection these cytokines are secreted by the cells and that triggers immune subsequent immune reaction in the downstream even so they are basically a intracellular signaling and cell communicating so so you might have come across the term cytokine storm it's happening in the covid patient what is that it's loss of the control Uh, how the host would behave by secreting these pro-inflammatory cytokines. Now, the pro-inflammatory cytokines is for there the secreted by the host cells to kill the or control the pathogen. But if it is uncontrolled, that is detrimental for the host as well. It could be detrimental uh, if because they circulate through blood throughout the body. It could be detrimental at the local level where they are secreted, or it can attack the other organs and. in most of these uh, severe respiratory uh, covid patient with severe respiratory distress we see that there is high cytokine storm with multiple organ failure so uh, when this pro inflammatory cytokines are induced in the body the anti or the uh, cytokines like th2 group of cytokines are also made which actually controls or regulates the action of the pro inflammatory cytokines but in case of this cytokine storm possibly that control is lost or less so here are some cytokine mentioned uh, which are uh, which are the th1 or the pro inflammatory which is elevated in these patients as well as there is report of elevations of the th2 cytokines now drugs can be uh, because these uh, cytokines are causing severe damage drugs have been uh, uh, which are already available against these cytokines are in use for the for the covid patients and one one such example is that hcq but we have to also think about that the cytokine profile of these covid patients is 
really peculiar and we are i mean the scientific community is investigating the details of that so here is a profile uh, picture showing you how it is happening how when the cytokine storm is arising so when there is infection initially with time some pro inflammatory or the inflammatory cytokine is rising and this rise is due to uh, type 1 interferon gamma response and this response subsequently is creating or inducing lot of genes downstream so here it shows the situation of a moderate or mild disease condition but when the disease is severe let us see what's the difference there is a sudden surge of this uh, cytokines which is the cytokine storm there is surge of the viral load and other factors the response type 1 this is severity therefore the patient needs to go to immediate supportive care now coming to uh, the gene expression in the host and how we can relate that to the severity or understand the disease here is one paper that i would want to refer so what they have done they have Uh, taken data from gene expression database where gene expression for lung and other subset of tissue was available for human non primates as well as mouse and they had compared the gene sets with uh, considering some genes which are the putative sars cov2 targets and they found that gene these genes are mostly not that it's secreted by all cells or made by all cells but some specific type of cells like the type 2 pneumocytes nasal secretory cells and the enterocytes they are active in this disease in the sense that they are making the receptor ace2 and the other new um, uh, protease which are required or which are actively have been actively characterized in the process of infection of sars cov2 now one difference was there that the mouse ace2 was not upregulated by the interferon but the human let me go yeah let uh, so ace2 is even though the role of ace2 has been long known in the angiotensin uh, renin angiotensin system but it was really surprising that this acts as a receptor for a viral entry as well so it's now known that from this report that it's a interferon stimulated gene that means when interferon is made or induced that activates ace2 so uh, interferon alpha type 1 these are the uh, this is the upstream uh, inducer and in human you can see there is high uh, elevation or induction of this gene ace2 but it is not in mouse so that again leads to a complicacy that whether the immune response is mouse uh, in mouse is different and can be model mouse for this disease so this is <coughs> another uh, paper which shows that the cytokines mainly the il1 pathway was active this was done from the patient the first few patients from china and uh, it shows that like when their respiratory distress was like at the peak even though the il1 pathway was active throughout but some other uh, pro inflammatory cytokines like il6 etc was high leading to the cytokine storm and with t cell activation so these different cells and the pro inflammatory pathways could be the targets for therapy now as we know that uh, the different person behaves uh, or the response towards the infection is different so in order to understand the role of the host genome multi scale and uh, multi institutional or multi uh, country wide large scale genomic studies have been undertaken and the results are not out but surely we are eagerly waiting for that to understand like which variations in the genome of the host is also playing role in this infection or this susceptibility a few uh, very um, uh, a small study small report i saw on ace2 variants so some of the variants uh, this this data has been taken from 
human genome data where they predict that these variants which are present normally in human could be like good for the human whereas some of them could be bad for the human like predicting the role in terms of their binding affinity to the SARS-CoV protein. But this is just the prediction. It needs to be validated experimentally and this is the same, uh, same data showing the picture that the different location where these variants are present and, and their putative function as some are directly enhancing the binding or some uh, someone directly disrupting the binding. But as I said, this needs to be experimentally validated. So SE2 is an interferon stimulatory gene, uh, mostly uh, secreted by the pneumocytes in lung, the ileal enterocytes and nasal goblet cells. And the gene is located on chromosome X. So how or uh, what does it uh, bring in new information? We know uh, that uh, even though it's an X chromosome, so the males have one set of X chromosomes where the females have two, but in spite of that, the one X chromosome is inactivated. Therefore, the effective dose or the effective presence is um, similar. Thereby, we do, right now we do not know the intricate regulation. So we cannot comment on whether males are more, inf uh, uh, more severe or susceptible or the females are. So another piece of information. So as I showed in the earlier slide that there are different variations in this receptor gene of the host. So what people have found that the African descended individuals, 90%, uh, sorry, 9% of the African descended individuals for AC2 may regulate the expression and be related to increased susceptibility in the African American to these infections. So this was a study done in United States. That's why they had mentioned about the African American. So uh, characterization of these genes, the host genes in a country wise manner with, will provide us an idea whether we can predict any differential susceptibility of people from different countries. Like we see in the Southeast Asia and Asia, even though the infection is high, but the mortality rate is low. So is there any difference? Is there any genetic or genomic difference among the people from one country to other? That's a question. So I'm almost to the end of my talk. Now how, uh, so this is the first stage we are at and we are understanding the, with help of genomics and sequencing. Now, how can that also help if a second wave comes? Now we are know the enemy. We are very familiar with that using these genomic tools. So in the, if there is any outbreak, we can shorten that outbreak. We have diagnosis. We have um, uh, the vaccines and other things are coming up. We will have soon the genomic information of the host and more and more about the pathogen. So if the next phase comes, now we are ready and we are geared up to fight to, for this infection. So this is overall uh, what I wanted to uh, talk about the host genome. And one more interesting factor is the microbiome. So microbiome is the collection of microbiomes, uh, microbes, all sorts of microbiomes in our body. They are organ specific. So the microbiomes differ from one organ to other. And it is well documented that they have some beneficial or adverse effect. So the association of SARS-CoV-2 with microbiome, uh, microbiome, particularly the gut and the lung will be very interesting to understand the pathogenesis of this, um, um, the SARS-CoV-2 in presence of this natural uh, fauna or flora of our different organs. So this area is very rapidly progressing and it will be very interesting to understand what is the outcome of this study. Finally, I would like to thank all the participants who have joined this webinar. And I would like to also acknowledge all the source of information that I have used to make this presentation and uh, my work uh, that the little piece of work that I discussed with, was done with along with uh, Dr. Bhattacharya, my colleague in the Institute. 
Uh, just before ending, I would like to talk a few uh, sentences about my institute because many of you do not know. So this is a institute under uh, Department of Biotechnology, Government of India, located in Kalani. Some pictures of my campus and just I would like to mention that the PhD program and integrated MSc program advertisement is open. So students, for the students, this is I am telling, if you are interested, you can go through our website. Mm -hmm. And our research area is chronic disease, infectious disease, cancer, and the statistical genomics. Our major focus is to understand the signature, genomic signature, transcriptomic signature, and the regulation. So our focus is to use genomics as a tool to understand, to predict, prevent, and cure diseases. Thank you. And this is the I'll, uh, I'll once again thank all the organizers and I would like to come to the end of my talk.